Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Cam's lecture. Our title tonight is Three Political Episodes in Pakistan from 1947 to 1971. This is a continuation from the political Muslims in Bengal 1905 to 1947, which took place in the last lecture. It is part of our ongoing series, which is the legacy of British colonial era in Bengal and thereafter. We have moved from British part to the Pakistan episode this evening. The aim of tonight's lecture is to give an understanding of political dynamics of Pakistan era in Bengal. Our lecturer tonight is Ruman Ahmed. Ruman Ahmed is a geostrategic and geoeconomics analyst. He served as an advisor to three former home secretaries and to the office of the deputy prime minister. He was a board member of the London Development Agency. He was on the first cohort of certified members of the Cert Chartered Institute of Fundraising and was a member of the Chartered Institute of Management, Junior London Chamber of Commerce and the Lo Royal Society of Arts. He was the founder chair of Nine Faiths Based Regeneration Network and was active in many national charities and voluntary organizations in the UK. We are extremely delighted to have Mr. Ruman Ahmed with us this evening. Without further ado, could I please request Mr. Ruman Ahmed to enlighten us with his lecture this evening? Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. First of all, thank you, Nofal, for that kind introduction and Nine for handling the slides. I'm going to start now, which is 6.15, and inshallah, I'll finish within 30 minutes by 6.45, and then Nafal, you take over. Just one second, because I don't know what nine did. I've lost my slides, so I have to now go back to just give me a minute, because I, I think what happened while nine was making the thing uh i have to exit full screen okay yeah now. That is i'm okay fine yeah. great the title of my talk today is three political episodes in pakistan from 47 to 1971. Uh, the first one is the adoption of the first constitution of the islamic republic of pakistan in 1956 the second point is about the military coup d'etat and imposition of martial law in 1958. And the third one is the Pakistan-India war in 1965, eventually leading to the outbreak of political movement against President Ayub Khan in 68 and 69. Before I go to the gist of the paper, let me, in a prelude, talk about the strategic and institutional inheritances of Pakistan at the time of partition in August 1941. I'll first deal with the military side. The newly established Pakistan faced harsh challenges from its inception. The government in Kabul refused to accept 19th century Anglo-Afghan treaties which now demarcated the country's boundaries with Afga Pakistan. Armed tribal incursions became a continual irritant. In 1955, diplomatic relations were severe. Later, Pakistan embassy in Kabul was ransacked. The Pakistan army had to repel major Afghan armed incursions in Bajor area of the Pakistan frontier north of the Khyber Pass in September 1960 and again in May 1961. To its east, West Pakistan had to face India and had major military skirmishes in 1947-48 in Kashmir, which then stalemated till today. In reality, Pakistan was too weak to face simultaneously both Indian and Afghan threats at the time of its inception. Pakistan Army in 1947 employed almost 500 British officers because of the shortfall of qualified Pakistanis in the technical branches and at senior army rank. Its first commander in chief 
was a British General Grassi, who controversially refused Qaeda Azam's orders to send troops to Kashmir in October 47. Hence, his contract was not renewed in 1951, and General Ayub Khan became the second and first Pakistani army chief. Let me talk about the bureaucracy. India, at the time of partition, inherited both the imperial colonial state central apparatus in the former imperial capital, New Delhi, and also the Bengal provincial secretariat in Calcutta. It's important to note that in East Bengal, at the time when partition took place in 1947, there was no administrative institutional infrastructure when the government was set up in the provincial capital Dhaka. Everything had to build up from ground zero. The Eden Girls School in Dhaka was sequestered as the site of the new provincial secretariat, which remains there till today. And as a result, many of you would remember in the old days, the secretariat used to be known as the Eden Building. Of the 133 Muslim Indian Civil Service, ICS, and Indian Political Service, IPS officials who opted for Pakistan in 47, only just one came from Bengal out of 133. Muslim officials from other areas were dispatched to East, Pakistan, East Bengal, which later was renamed East Pakistan under the one unit policy in 1955. Although this remedy was to evoke later claims of internal colonization by Bengalis. Even as late as May 1960, 13 years after partition, the joint in the Pakistan Punjab Partition Implementation Committee was grinded its way through various financial disputes. Now I concentrate on the political side. Jinnah died in September 1948 from tuberculosis cancer after prolonged illness. Prime Minister Lia Katali Khan was assassinated in 1951. Many held the CIA responsible. Even before the 1947 partition, there was organizational atrophy of the Muslim League outside Bengal. Contrast this to the pyramidal Congress organization, which stretched from New Delhi down to the villages all over India. Interestingly, only Bengal had an elected Muslim League government at the time of partition. The other four provinces in West Pakistan had non-Muslim League government still partition. And then on 14 August 1947, or just before, Muslim League chief ministers were imposed on these four provinces through political machinations. Welcome to democratic Pakistan. It truly shows that the Muslim League was essentially a quote unquote paper tiger, as shown by the subsequent wipeout of the Muslim League, even in East Bengal in the 1954 elections, where Juk the front won. No wonder from its inception, Pakistan was ruled by a coterie of senior ICS and later CSP civil servants, and they were supported by the military establishment. The weak and self serving, largely feudal West Pakistani political class were beholden to this unelected self serving grouping which in today's parlance may be called the deep state. East Pakistanis did not matter as they had no seat in the top table. Even 20 years later, President Ayub Khan did not have a single Bengali advisor in his presidential office in Islamabad. No wonder they were all clueless to the perception of discrimination being felt by the much more politically conscious Bengalis right from the inception of the new nation state. Much later, President Mirza, Iskandar Mirza, justifying the introduction of martial law in 1948, castigated the politicians, amongst others, for, quote, prostitution of Islam for political ends, unquote. Now I want to focus on the first point, which is the adoption of the first constitution of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan in 1956. 
Let me now say a few words on the nine long years which Pakistan took to adopt its first constitution. The Constituent Assembly of India adopted its constitution on 26 November 1949, and it became effective on 26 January 1950. There were so many factions and sub-fractions in the Pakistan's Constituent Assembly that to recount their unparliamentary antics and shenanigans, I'll need three Zoom sessions like today so as to make sense of it all for you. Suffice to say that the first constitution was finally adopted on 29 February 1956. And the new Islamic Republic of Pakistan came to existence shortly afterwards when Mirzafur's descendant, Iskandar Mirza, and this I'm not using as a abuse. Actually, Iskandar Mirza uh, is a descendant of, from Mirzafur's family, according to Iskandar Mirza's own autobiography. Took the post of president and then immediately went on to subvert the new constitution through the president's wide-ranging executive authority, which contradicted those elements in the constitution which reflected the Westminster model. Soon, prime ministers and the cabinets came and went like a musical chair game, with Iskandar Mirza as the puppet master, true, true to his Indian political service background. Now I come to the second point, which is the military coup d'etat and the imposition of martial law in 1958. As early as 19 May 1958, President Mirza and General Ayub Khan, then army chief, had separately conveyed to the US ambassador that only a dictatorship would work in Pakistan. Though Pakistan's first ever general elections were scheduled for late 1958 under the new constitution, President Mirza imposed martial law on 7th October 1958, and the scheduled elections were canceled. And the constitution which took nine years to write was abrogated in minutes by a martial law promulgation. Two days before the Supreme Court judgment of 27 October, which legalized the new martial law regime, President Mirza announced the formation of a 12-man cabinet. The youthful Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, barely in his early 30s, was appointed as Commerce Minister. And Ayub Khan, the chief martial law administrator, was named as prime minister. Just four members out of the 12 were from East Pakistan. But at 10 o'clock on 27 October, Mirza and his Iranian wife, Khanum Nahid, were given little more than an hour to pack and were informed that they would, they would have to buy their own airline tickets and pay for their passports. Then they were shunted into a London exile, where Iskandar Mirza became a manager in the famous Virasami Indian restaurant on Piccadilly. So much for his Machiavellian politics. Military coup of 27 October 1958. The post of the prime minister was abolished, but the cabinet, which had been sworn in earlier that very day, in the morning, under President Mirza, now agreed to serve the new military president Ayub Khan as Pakistan entered a new post-partition era. The salient features of Ayub Khan's tenure rules in very brief sort of bullet points are that he introduced a new type of democracy called basic democracy with 60,000 basic Democrats from each of the two wings of Pakistan, grand total of 120,000. Then in 1962, a new constitution came into operation on 8 June, when the newly elected Pakistan National Assembly, elected by the basic Democrats as an electoral college, held its first session. And martial law was also withdrawn on that day after 44 months. But the political parties still remain banned. Students in Dhaka burned copies of this 1962 constitution after its promulgation. And there were student protests throughout East Pakistan. 
The title Islamic was dropped from the country's name. Of course, the ulama immediately opposed this. Ayub Khan was then forced to retreat on this and the Islamic Republic was restored. Political parties were also legalized by an act in July, 1962. Ayub Khan then joined the Convention Muslim League in December, 1963 at its, as its president and a breakaway group known as Council Muslim League later adopted Fatima Jinnah, the sister of Qaeda Azam is his leader. This was the beginning of the dynastic politics. In 1965 presidential election, Ayub Khan won over Fatima Jinnah. And the election was essentially through that electoral college of 120,000 basic Democrats. The period from 1958 onwards witnessed increasing alienation of the Sindhi and the Bengali populations. In September 1965, there was a 17 day war between India and Pakistan, which also stalemated. And Later, permanent ceasefire was ensured through the Tashkent Accord under the auspices of Soviet Union government in January 1966. Next year in 67, February, the opposition met in a national conference in Lahore, but the small contingent of East Pakistani delegates soon quit this oppositional national conference because the gathering failed to support a demand for more autonomy in the Eastern Wing, as expressed by the six point program of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the leader of the East Pakistan Awami League. Now I focus on the third and the final point outbreak of political agitation and buildup of mass movement against Ayub Khan in 1968 69. From October 1968 to March 1969, countrywide agitations took place in both the wings till Ayub Khan's resignation on 25th March 1969. But there were different bases of agitations in the two wings. In East Pakistan, Maulana Abdul Hamid Khan Bhashani addressed a large gathering in early November 1968 in Dhaka Stadium's outer field, popularly known as Paltan Maidan. And in a fiery speech, the Red Maulana declared a mass movement to oust Ayub Khan from power. Earlier in 1956, at the founding conference of National Army Party, he said, Assalamu alaikum to West Pakistan. Meanwhile, all the central student organization of the Eastern province from Kendriyo Chhatro Shangram Purisha, Central Student Struggle Council, and announced an 11 point demand which then became the main charter of the NTI people's movement in East Pakistan. These both catalyzed the student movement and the subsequent mass uprising. After left-wing student leader Asadud Jaman was killed in police firing on 20 January 1969, the nature of the peaceful student and mass movement changed and it soon turned into a mass youth search against the Ayub Khan regime and all its institutions. The movement soon took a violent turn, which like a wildfire spread across the whole of the province in February and March. By the time General Ayya Khan took power and declared martial law on 25th March, 1969, large parts of both the wings were ungovernable. That is why the politicians who believed in parliamentary democracy did not oppose the imposition of martial law and accepted Ayya Khan's roadmap to general elections in 1970. Now, having sort of framed some key episodes, I now come to the postlude where I try to discuss a key problematic. And that's my quest to understand the Bangladesh phenomena. All of the above was to provide a short, snappy summary of the three political episodes in the Pakistan period of our history within two nights, 30 minute Zoom presentation. So as to lay the political terrain for my key problematic, which I'm now going to elaborate. My intention is to raise some pertinent questions, which I did not find answer to in the dozens of books by esteemed academics and political practitioners which I have read over the past half a century. In my opinion, in order to understand present day Bangladesh politics, 
we need to deeply excavate the crucial 36 months between September 1965, India-Pakistan war, and the volcanic eruption of mass agitation against Ayub Khan in both wings from October 1968. But tonight, I want to primarily concentrate on East Pakistan. This is because the 1968 to 1971 generation of student and political activists in East Pakistan dominated later day Bangladesh politics even up to recently. With their political and ideological worldviews from during those tumultuous times, for 50 long years, they have framed Bangladesh's narrative from their perspectives with all its consequences. During the 1965 September war, students from Dhaka University, Engineering University, and various colleges and schools in patriotic fervor and mood of national solidarity queued in the Dhaka Medical College blood bank to donate blood for the injured Pakistani soldiers in the Western wing in their thousands. That is a recorded fact of history. But also within a very short span of three years, these very same students went on violent agitation against the Pakistan government, army, and the in various institutions of the state on the streets of the province. I am myself an eyewitness and participant. For my extensive readings of popular liberation movements around the world, I have not come across such dramatic and transformative national mood swings in such a short span of time. The question keeps niggling me, why the Bangladesh independence movement happened so quickly, when in most other countries, it took years, decades, and sometimes even centuries for national public opinion to mature and contribute towards a collective understanding of a national, separate national identity and nationhood. If culture is a major component of one's own and the nation's identity, then we find very little from the Bengali novels, plays, poems, essays written in the 1950s and 60s to indicate to us that such a separate and distinct Bengali national identity was in the process of being formed in East Pakistan. Rather, the literatures of the period were writing within a Muslim frame of mind steep in Pakistani nationhood. Popular poets like Jasimuddin, Farooq Ahmed, Asan Habib, and many others, or award-winning writers like Moniruddin Yusuf, or political come literary figures like Abul Mansur Ahmed, or Muhammad Waliullah, or singers and composers like Abbasuddin or Kalim Sharafi, or serious actors like Ariful Haq, through their works, their writings and creative endeavors highlighted the need to develop a new culture for Pakistan encompassing all. Even Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's unfinished autobiography gives no indication of thinking about a separate Bengali nation state distinct from the Pakistan nation state. For those of you who are not particularly familiar with the period, let me contextualize and state that in these three years, 1966, 1967, and even in 1968 up to October, there was no mass state-sponsored political killings, no abduction of political activists, or any significant political or social upheaval in East Pakistan, apart from the routine agitations or odd hot tals now and then. It was a period of relative political calm and increasing economic growth and prosperity. The agricultural green revolution was in full swing. The middle class was rapidly increasing and education at all levels was spreading too. Those of us from that period present in today's session will testify to that. The only significant political event in those three years period was the holding of the trial of the Agatola conspiracy case from 19 June 1968 to mid-February 1969 in Dhaka Cantonment. The tribunal was headed by three judges. The chair, Justice S. A. Rahman, was a non-Bengali. The other two members, M. R. Khan and Matsumul Al-Hakim, were Bengalis. 
The government withdrew the Agatara conspiracy case on 22nd February 1969 due to mass agitations and the resultant violence in January, February 69, when certain parts of East Pakistan became very simply ungovernable. I can also had to call off that trial so that Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who was the number one accused person in the case, could attend the roundtable conference convened by Ayub Khan on 3rd March 1969 in Islamabad as a free person. So my political and intellectual curiosity is still insatiate as to how a significant and decisive portion of Bengalis decided that Pakistan was no longer the country of the choice through this period. And thus on 26 March 1971, a new nation state was given birth to. The historians, political scientists, sociologists, economists, psychologists, and other practitioners in related disciplines need to study the then East Pakistan society, economy, politics, and culture, so as to understand how once patriotic East Pakistanis gallivanted towards the idea of an independent country in just three years, from 1968 to 71. Joy Bangla and Shonar Bangla became the rallying call instead of Pakistan Zindabad and Pak Sar Zamin Sadbad, the national anthem of Pakistan. Who, how, and what motivated these tens of thousands to chart out a new trajectory for their homeland? Could a national awakening among the activists for an imminent independence has spring, simply sprung overnight? That to me is too simplistic and ignores the tectonic place of national awareness, national consciousness and motive force in history and how they interact with each other in a historical time, time frame. If one reads the English language weekly newspaper, The Forum, published from Dhaka during the period 1969 to 71, and which was largely spearheaded by pro awamilik intellectuals like Rahman Soban and Dr. Kamal Hussein, we find no discussion of separate Bengali nation state identity or issues concerning independence in its pages. Rather, the forum acted like an intellectual think tank to press for the six points demands and the incorporation in the new Pakistan constitution to be formulated by the Constituent Assembly after the general elections. If the pro League leading intellectuals of the Eastern province were not talking about these issues, then how did the issue of independence and separate nation state see some activist imagination. Who were influencing them? How, when, why, where were the inspirations coming from? We also know so little about the silent portion of the majority of the Bengali populace who in their hearts were probably uneasy yet indecisive or perhaps clueless as to what to do about the emerging phenomena towards creating a new nation state called Bangladesh. The right is pro-Pakistani political parties completely and totally fail these Pakistan populists. Even to, this, the, even to this day, they are simply not aware of the magnitude of their political failure. The left, mostly underground, remain mired in sectarian ideological and fatricidal polemics and never surface. Let me now analyze the 1970 general elections. The 7th December 1970 general elections, we must not forget that in the famed 1970 United Pakistan's only first and last general election, only 56% of the registered electorate in East Pakistan voted. 46% did not vote. Of that 56% who voted, 75% voted for Sheikh Mujibur Rahman led Awami League. This means that of the total registered East Pakistani voters, Awami League only obtained only 42%. This means that a majority, i.e. 58% of the eligible and registered voters did not vote for the Awami League. Therefore, one cannot say that the people in 1970 elections voted for the creation of an independent Bangladesh. And neither was independence on the election manifest of the Awami League. Independence was never raised as an election issue during the election campaign. Yet, from the election day on 7 December 1970, 
to 26 March 1971, within 108 days, independent Bangladesh was officially declared. Can the deep DNA of a nation be changed overnight or within such very few weeks? There are so many unanswered questions because the questions are not simply being raised in the first place by those who are writing and framing the history of that video. There is a similar deafening silence on the later killings of thousands and rapes of hundreds of innocent Bihari and non-Bengali civilians in 1971 in then East Pakistan. It seems that the gatekeepers of the knowledge generation are being selective of what should be known or not in the public domain. Because privately, over the decades, I've met and discussed with dozens of people who are very much familiar with the issues I'm raising in tonight's presentation. Many were simply scared of rocking the boat or putting their heads above the parapet, lest their heads get chopped off. The role of an intellectual is to speak truth to power. The great theologian and jurist, Imam Abu Hanifa from 699767, did precisely that in the 8th century, and the rest is history. The time has come for Bangladesh to have a national historical soul searching. One cannot have a grounded and meaningful stake holding in the country's future without understanding one's real past. Bangladesh, no doubt, has made tremendous economic and social progress over the past three decades. Shabash Bangladesh. Let this progress continue to ever greater heights till we became a major world power to reckon with by the 2050s, inshallah. It is possible, it is doable. All power to the Bangladeshis. They are truly adaptive, creative, poetic, innovative, resilient, and entrepreneurial. They are great Bangladesh. After 50 years on, I'm still searching for an understandable explanation of the exponential growth of the Bangladesh phenomena. And I hope that many of you will be inspired to join in this intellectual quest to deeply understand and thoroughly excavate a crucial period of our beloved homeland's history. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone for joining. And uh, we thank uh, Ruman Bai uh, for uh, preparing the, um, the lecture and Naim Bai for helping with the presentation. And, uh, and we thank you all for taking part and making valuable contributions uh, to the discussion. Uh, look forward to seeing you to the next lecture on 19th of May. And with that, we are closing our lecture tonight and see you in the next lecture. Bye for now.